As an introduction, I, uh, I just retired in August of 2015 after 35 years of law enforcement myself. 30 years with the city of Kirkland, five years as the police chief of uh, Makotio, a little town up north of Seattle. And it's been, uh, it's been a heck of a ride. I'm second generation. I, my dad was a renting officer and lieutenant from 1962 to 1989. More than 55 years of law enforcement experience growing up in the culture, growing up in the family. I now work at the police academy where I work with all of these unbelievable young men and women who are just starting out in their career. I met a couple of the reserve, uh, sorry, the uh, explorers here who are getting ready to hopefully join the, the uh, police service or maybe the fire service if they're feeling fire service. Uh, yeah. fire service. Fire service. It, it's very important to get relaxed. So you guys, we'll get some cops over at this table to do some recruiting here right now. Uh, but what I look at is, yeah, better hurry. Uh, what I look at when I talk with these officers who are now 21 years old, when they're my age, God forbid, it's going to be the year 2052. That's 35 more years ahead of us, and I know Gary's already laughed up here. I learned my job in the, in the late 70s and early 80s from cops that started in the 40s and 50s. I'm now passing what knowledge I have, and no pun intended to torch, onto the new generation. As are all of you, the FTOs, the sergeants, the cops in the room. Associated with that is the community aspect of what we do as law enforcement. And there is no greater uh, event in law enforcement worldwide than law enforcement torch run. I'll go through some statistics a little bit later, talk about what torch run is, how it works, but uh, it, is more, it is in more than 40 countries around the world. More than 40 countries. We've got half a dozen agencies represented here. Our brothers and sisters around this planet, 97,000 strong, raised $54 million last year. Wow. $54 million. Over half a million of that just in Washington State. So it's very exciting to be here to talk about it. Uh, Mary's going to work on turning on a video here. I'm going to figure out how, maybe. That's how the pressure works, as soon as I saw you get up. So I'll keep talking. <laughs> and, well, maybe. Anyway, so we're going to show you a video here. Then I'm going to introduce uh, CEO of Special Olympics Washington, Dave Lennox. He's got some words for us. And we're waiting, waiting for Rico uh, Morales to show up as our athlete speaker. And then uh, we'll talk about LETR a little bit. Here we go. Yeah, here's the video. Changing the world is a contact sport. And when it comes to changing the world, there are no better athletes than the athletes of Special Olympics. Every day around the world, Special Olympics athletes come to the playing fields to learn, to grow, to compete, and to win. The Special Olympics Athlete Oath embodies this spirit. Let me win. But if I cannot win, let me be brave in the attempt. At Special Olympics, we envision a world where everyone belongs, where bravery triumphs, ability emerges, skills grow, laughter invites. The human spirit is unleashed and the world is changed. One volunteer, one fan, one doctor, one teacher, one athlete at a time. Founded by Eunice Kennedy Shriver in 1968, Special Olympics is led by millions of athletes with intellectual disabilities in more than 170 countries, each embodying the beauty of difference. And Special Olympics athletes compete in over 80,000 competitions a year and World Winter or Summer Games every two years. Special Olympics is an everyday opportunity to make a difference in the world, bringing together people of all abilities to create a world of respect and inclusion. We're a global network of families who share inspiration, hope, and understanding. We're coaches, volunteers, and community builders, reaching out to children and adults who might otherwise be forgotten in some of the most remote parts of the world. And though sports is our engine, Special Olympics is so much more. We're changing the world in many different ways and in many different arenas. We're Special Olympics healthy athletes, the world's largest public health organization for people with intellectual disabilities. We're Special Olympics Healthy Communities, 
changing how governments, businesses, and policymakers address the unmet health needs of adults and children with intellectual disabilities. We're Special Olympics Unified Sports, helping to build relationships and understanding between people with and without intellectual disabilities. We're Special Olympics Young Athletes, unlocking the power of sports for the youngest children, ages two to seven, and their families. We're Athlete Leaders, trained and empowered, demanding respect and leading by example all around the world. Through the power and joy of sports, Special Olympics is revealing the champions in all of us. Come play with us. Together, we will change the world through sport. Okay, I forgot the lights here. Oh, it's, like a, it's like a disco. There we go. So, uh, with that brief introduction on Special Olympics, I'm going to ask all of our athletes to please stand up. Athletes in the room. We'll, we'll have some uh, introductions with the athletes. Go ahead and grab a seat and some more snacks. Uh, we'll, we'll do some introductions with athletes here in just a moment, but I want to introduce uh, a very important partner in this. Um, well, Special Olympics LETR has been around for about 35 years. LETR, that's Law Enforcement Torch Run. The, uh, the actual Special Olympics as an organization has been around much longer. And our uh, state CEO, Dave Lennox, is here to tell us a bit more about Special Olympics. So, first of all, thank you for having me, and thank you for all that you're doing. Um, Special Olympics is really about community. Um, we started off with a little bit of a, a different focus, and I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is walk you through the 50-year history of, of the organization. Um, it should only take me four or five hours, um, but it's really exciting, I think. But, so, um, but the partnership with law enforcement changed Special Olympics. Um, when we started off in 1968, we were uh, we were a charity. I mean, we were the you know in that suite. We're going to let these poor little kids pretend they're at the Olympics, and isn't that going to be sweet? You know, they, in 1968, forward-thinking people, these were the these were the, the radicals, said, you know, people with intellectual disability don't have to be in institutions. They would be fine, and this was a quote from a researcher, they would be fine if you gave them a sucker and a park bed. You don't have to put them in institutions. That was the forward thinking in 1968 around this population. And you look at these athletes now, and I don't see any of you sitting on a park bench anytime soon. Um, and I get railed on all the time by athletes because they're worried about how healthy the food is. So I don't think the sucker's in your future either. So. If, if we at the first Special Olympics, they couldn't have any team sports where you switched back and forth from offense to defense because they said, this population can't handle that. They won't know how to switch from offense to defense like in basketball or in soccer. Really? You know, and, and look at us now. And again, these were the forward-thinking people. These were the people who started Special Olympics. They were the good guys. So I always tell people now when, when someone says, oh, well, you know, people with intellectual disability, they can't do that. I'm like, you know, we're pretty much laughing at these people 50 years ago. So be careful what you say, because 50 years from now, someone's going to be going, did you know that in 2017, they thought athletes couldn't fill in the blank? So that's kind of the, the way the movement works. So add to this, in about 1982, right? One, two. 81. 81. Um, Chief Lemonian from, from Kansas said, you know, I think we need a partnership you know, with, with Special Olympics because law enforcement is about building community and we see these athletes in our community, but they seem to be neglected. They seem to, no one seems to be paying any attention. So he kind of helped Special Olympics move into, away from this kind of charity thing to more of a community thing. So that was kind of the beginning of a big change. Now Special Olympics is in 180 countries. We have over 5 million athletes that are competing. 
And we've gone from, oh, well, they probably can't do that, to we now have triathlon, marathon, we've got athletes that have run the Boston Marathon. We did a study a couple years ago comparing times at a Special Olympics World Games to the, Special Olymp to the, to the regular Olympics. So I looked at the, the times of our athletes in the 100 meter, the 200 meter, the 400 meter in athletics, and the, the 100 meter in swimming, freestyle. 57 performances at our World Special Olympic Games were better than the slowest time at the Olympics that qualified, and none of those people came from the United States. So, those athletes, Special Olympics athletes, could have represented their country in the Olympics if that country had valued them as full citizens. But they didn't. So, we started to call out to say, it's time to pay attention. Pay attention to this population. They've got a lot to offer. So Special Olympics, like I said, we started off with this charity thing. Then, in the 80s, we also switched and said, now we think we're a sports organization. So the International Olympic Committee signed a protocol with us in 1982 that said, yep, you're part of the Olympic movement. So the IOC said there are three parts of the Olympic movement. There's the regular, which we refer to as the boring Olympics. Um, okay, so they're all fast. Whoa. Um, Paralympics, you know, with, for physical and sensory disabilities, and Special Olympics. And with that, the IOC said, now every person in the world has access to the Olympic movement. Everyone can be and aspire to be and become an Olympian. So that's good. So we started on that path. So now instead of charity, now we're sport and our athletes just happen to have intellectual disability. So we began to get some credibility in that area. And then, lo and behold, now how long did it take us to get to this point? We thought to talk to the athletes. Okay, why we didn't do that before, I don't know, but remember, forward thinking always, immediately. So we started asking them, what do you want? What do you want this movement to be? And we were ready for, oh, we want these more sports and all that stuff, and we certainly got a lot of that. But we also got, you know, we don't want to be anyone's charity case. We want to be full contributing members of the community. We want to help. We don't want you to always feel like you're giving to us. We want to give back. We want you to call us when you need help. Because we're willing to volunteer. We're willing to help in any way. So, a good example, in, in North Dakota, Minot Base was being flooded. They didn't know what to do. They called Special Olympics and said, can you, and the other's like, hell yeah, we can do that. We can, we can build sandbags. I mean, <laughs> we, we, we. so they did. Save the airbase. So, and our athletes all over the world now say, we want to volunteer. We want to help you make the community better because we know what it's like to be left out, and we don't want anyone else left out either. So we started thinking, okay, well, inclusion seems to be an important thing here. So. So we started talking about that. My favorite inclusion quote, though, was I asked, I said, how do you feel about inclusion? Should we do that? Should we not do that? And this one athlete said, yeah, yeah, this is great. That's a great idea. We need to do inclusion. He said, okay, well, what does that look like? And we talked about it. And he said, well, we can have all the other people come into Special Olympics, and they can, you know, they can compete with us, too. And so, and we've had started unified sports, which I'll explain in a little bit. But, and I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. I think when we talk about inclusion, we mean you being included like in Parks and Rec programming, or that. And he looked at me and goes, well, why would we do that? Don't you want to be included? He goes, well, here's the thing. When we go there, people make fun of each other, and it's all this, you know, bragging, tough guy stuff. At Special Olympics, we know how to do this. We know how to do it, so everyone feels good. So why don't we invite them to come to us instead of us going to them? Uh, okay, I mean, I like this guy. <laughs> We've got the model that the rest of the world should use, which is really think about what the athlete experience is like. So, if you talk about the mission of Special Olympics, it really boils down to this. Remember when you were a kid, and someone who you may have liked and you may have hated said, I bet I can beat you to that tree. 
And of course they cheat, and they start before you get a chance to say yes or no, right? Okay, so you're running, and you're running so hard and so fast that you're afraid you're going to fall forward and trip because you've got to beat this person. The adrenaline rush that you get from doing that is amazing. Most of our athletes never heard those words, I bet I can beat you in the tree. Either because the people around them just weren't paying attention to them at all, or they assumed they wouldn't be able to do it. That's what we do. We put our athletes in situations where they have to push themselves. They're in a division and they're close, and they're going to have to push themselves to win. And they get better every time they do it. So now we focus on personal bests. So the medals are great, but there are tons of medals. But to personal best and, and seeing yourself improve and become healthier, that's a reward. So we started listening to the athletes a little bit more, a little bit more. We created unified sports. So unified sports is where half the team has intellectual disability, half do not. They compete as equals on the team. They train and compete together. They learn the sport together. And it's, it's really, really rewarding. I competed in unified bocce, which, you know, leads to Special Olympics to turn an Italian drinking game into a sport. But, you know, but it works. Yeah. And in Seattle, we do it at a bar, so it makes it even better. So, um, but I also did uh, unified open water swimming. And my part, I had two different athletes that I would swim with. We had different strategies, depending on how we had to develop a strategy, and we swim a mile, open water. There we were swimming in the Potomac River, which was... Yeah, that was scary. Cold. Uh, well, no, it wasn't so much cold, it was just dirty. Oh. <laughs> cold is here. Yeah. <laughs> so we're having trouble starting it here. I can't figure out what the problem is. Um, but but it's, it, it's a great thing where you learn and you kind of build these friendships and, and you go along. But again, the community thing is a big piece of it. So we then started to talk to athletes a little bit more and they're saying you know we, we want to do more things we want to give you advice on how to run the organization i think they thought maybe we weren't doing it as well as we should so now we have athlete input councils so aren't there some athletes here that are have, on an input council Wayne is. so are you on athlete council the input council yes stand in. So we have athlete input councils now around the state and they sit and they tell us what's important to them so that we can move the organization the direction they want us to go. They're now leading us, not us. We're following your ideas, so you better have good ones. Because they're so thanks. You. So So you see a shifting. Then one of the things we learned, again as we're talking, was the issue of health. And health of our athletes was, you know, it was kind of the elephant in the middle of the room that we, everyone kind of knew that our athletes weren't as healthy overall as they might, should have been, or as the rest of the public. So, and an athlete that I was training, he was running track, he's great, he could run like a gazelle. I'm like, but every time he ran a race, he came in second. And I knew he could run faster. I said, what's the deal? He goes, well, I have to follow someone. As a coach, I had been running ahead of him because I was trying to get me run faster. <laughs> so then I said, so what is, I can't see the lines on the track. But oh. So in Special Olympics, we started to investigate that more and more and discovered that doctors, in medical school, doctors spend less than 5% of their time even thinking about people with disabilities. So they don't know how to ask the question. So I asked the I asked this athlete, I said, so didn't, didn't you have an eye test? He goes, yeah, but the guy's crazy. I said, what do you mean? He goes, he kept saying, which is better, A or B? And there was no A or B on any of that stuff. I said, what'd you say? He goes, I So the, the doctor assumes he can't see. 75% of people with intellectual disability in the United States have their own glasses. Because the doctor didn't know how to do the fact. If you don't know your letters and someone says, read the third line down, what do you do? No. Um, yeah. <laughs> so they have the wrong left. Dental issues. Our athletes have a high tolerance of pain, so they don't say, my tooth hurts. 60% of our athletes have untreated tooth decay. Because no one thinks to look no one cares enough to really take them and make sure they're getting the follow-up care 
and so and the and the doctors don't don't look into. We've diagnosed more cases of oral cancer in our athletes because no one was paying attention. And they just said, well, they don't complain. Well, our athletes have learned over time not to complain. They survive by telling us what we, they think we want to hear. And that's not acceptable. So we said, no, 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 we've got to change this. And we now train physicians in seven disciplines in how to work with people with intellectual disabilities. So you get the right diagnosis. You know, it's just as easy to say, here's a chart and it's got shapes. And you say, point to the shapes you see. Now we get accurate diagnosis. So we have dental care, we have vision, we have hearing. 40% of our athletes have reduced hearing because of wax buildup. That's all you gotta do is pull it out. You know, it's not, it's not that hard. Again, no one was paying attention. And people assumed that they just, well, that's just part of their intellectual disability. You know, they can't, you know, they didn't understand that. I said, no one thought to think, well, maybe they can't hear you. So we started, we started trying to fix all those things. Now Special Olympics is the largest health care provider for people with intellectual disability in the world. Okay, we were a charity. We're, remember our little sports thing? We're like, oh, isn't that cute? Well, then we're on track. To realizing the problems that exist for this population because they've been ignored. So we now fix that. So in addition to that, now we're doing healthy communities. 75% of our athletes are obese. Could be medical interactions. But likewise, when you look at it, I think it's like 60% of the general population is obese. So we're now doing healthy communities. Find problems in the community, get that unified concept going, and say, you know what, we could all benefit if we walked a little bit. How about we create a community walking club? Yeah, the athletes, for some reason, I keep hearing from these input councils, Zumba. They want to do unified Zumba classes. Okay. I've not been to a Zumba class. I have no intention of going to a Zumba class. I, however, will make sure that you get a Zumba class if you need that. So, so it's just amazing the things that, they do. still in this day and age, you see, I have one more health story just because it's horrifying but shows you how, how important this is. This happened in Kentucky two years ago. An athlete was, was, got sick, low fever, you know, didn't know, no one knew what to do. Mom takes him to the doctor, gets worse, gets worse, gets worse. Finally, they're like, okay, we're taking him to the emergency room. In the emergency room, in the hospital for a couple of days, and they said, we're so sorry to tell you this, but we have to, we're going to have to you know, admit him to a hospice. There's nothing we can do. Devastating. The mom thought to call Special Olympics. She said, you've got a health program, right? Yeah. So we sent one of our physicians in Kentucky over, and he looked at all the records, looked at the guy at the hospice, and said, okay, now I know you're not supposed to do treatment, but why is he here? What's the diagnosis? What, what is he dying of? And I said, terminal cerebral palsy. <laughs> we all have terminal palsy. We don't die from cerebral palsy. <laughs> and everyone was just like, well, you know, he has intellectual disability, and, and that's just kind of what you have to expect. The guy looks at it and goes, you know, the only test that comes back bad is for a urinary tract infection. <laughs> Could we maybe try some penicillin? <laughs> they did one round, the guy fixed off, he's back running track. Special Olympics cured terminal cerebral palsy. <laughs> <laughs> Two years ago. We have to be vigilant in every community because who knows how many of those other cases are like that, that no one figured out to check. So, so that's kind of where Special Olympics has moved to. We now I'll also learn we're engaging young people, and young people say, you know, when I started volunteering for Special Olympics in 1970, um, it was it was it was a cool thing to do. You know, it looked good on a college resume kind of thing, and, and it was, it was 
And so I knew that I would go hand out lunches or maybe give awards out. I think my first job was shagging basketballs at an individual skills competition. So that's great. But I, I got the whole, you got to pay your dues, you work your way up. <coughs> Young people today are not into paying dues. You may, not have, you may have noticed that. Now, you got to show them that they're changing the world. Young people tell us, we will engage with you if what you're doing makes the world a better place. The minute we sense that you are, I started to say blowing smoke, but I, I'll, I won't. <laughs> but the minute we sense that this is just about helping you do something you want to do, we're out. Convince us that we're changing the world, we're in. So we now engage young people more and more and more in what we're doing. So that's kind of, you see the, the future of where we're headed with the organization. We've got, you know, our, our strategic plan now has four pillars. The first is sport. We will always be a sports organization. But the second, I, I've got to be in a certain order because I'm in it for dramatic effect. <laughs> so the second is wellness. We are going to be continually committed to raising awareness about wellness in this population and their families. Do they have nutritional literacy? Do they know what eating stuff does for you? Third is inclusion. Making sure that young people all around, and, and I, was, I was talking when we had our law enforcement torturing conference. One thing that we offer for law enforcement is something to do with those at-risk kids or those marginalized kids who the rest of the system seems to leave behind. You know, when, when I was in high school before crack was a drug, we called them crack kids. They just got dropped. They weren't the varsity athletes. They weren't the, the ones that were you know, already in jail. They were just the, the, the like 80% of the school population that just quietly goes through the school year. No one knows what's going on in their head. Well, what if we went to those people and said, hey, want to run track with some Special Olympics athletes? It's kind of fun, kind of weird. You know, you might fit. We did this in, in one state I went to and I went to visit and there's this goth girl. And I was like, not what I expected to see at a track meet. And I went to her and I said, I said, what's the deal? And she said, I was, I was out smoking cigarette one day at school and the school resource officer came up to me and said, what are you doing? You know, what, you, where, are you, where are you going in life? She said, I don't know. Uh -oh. And he said, well, why don't you come do this? You know, it's, it's kind of edgy, kind of weird. But yeah, she said, these people are great. And everyone else ignores them. And, it, and she just felt like she had found this great world where she could help other people quietly and be a good person even though she had the golf stick on. So we offer that for, and we're in over 200 high schools in the state of Washington. Where we go into the school and say, we can change the culture of this high school so that it values inclusion and the lunch table is no longer the, the societal <laughs> system of the jocks over here and the social people over here and the druggies over here. You know. <coughs> Mix it up. So we do that in every, in every high school we can get into. So, and then finally, our last one is community. We've got to be about building community and inclusion of our athletes into the community, not as a charity case, but as someone who can help. Law enforcement has done more to help us in that than any other entity. Our athletes sit and everyone's, oh, well, we don't know, you know. And law enforcement is like the big brother that stands behind you. <laughs> so you're facing down something you think you're not going to be able to beat. And miraculously, you do it. And for our athletes and for our organization, law enforcement is the big brother standing behind going, we believe in them. You don't mess with them unless you're going to mess with me. Which is a great message for our, for our athletes to know that law enforcement has their back. Law enforcement believes in them, believes that they have abilities, believes that they deserve to have good health care, that they deserve to be a member and a full contributing part of the community. So that has been going on here in Washington for a good long while, and we're excited about doing it, and we're glad that we're expanding now, Mason County joining us. All right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Our ways to go, we've got 17,000 athletes now in the state of Washington. There are 180,000 people in the state of Washington that, uh, that qualify for Special Olympics because they have intellectual disability. So we're making great progress, but we need more Mason counties because people willing to step up and say, yeah, this is worth our time and worth us doing. So that's what we're up to. Join us.
join a unified team, certainly get involved with the torch run, <laughs> so, and support everything that's going on in your community. And I think you're gonna hear from some athletes here in a minute too, so enjoy. So we were we were hoping to get uh, Rico Morales here, but it looks like the B Cats are in the house. So let's big hand for the B Cats. And as, as Dave was saying, uh, Unified Sports. Uh, we Shelton. You guys are from Shelton High School, right? There they are. And as much as I'd like to just stand here for the benefit of our camera guys and do this thing and be that kind of speaker, uh, this is an impediment to having this conversation. I want to introduce uh, some athletes. Uh, Cammie, would you come up? There we go. I'm going to give you the microphone, tell us your story, and I might shoot some questions at you. My name is Cammie Mayon, and I'm a representative for uh, Special Olympics and Gig Harbor program. And um, I've been an athlete for five or six years. Started out in basketball, and now I only do soccer, softball, bowling, and help out with swimming and basketball. And I'm an African ambassador slash um, uh, athlete leader. And I wouldn't have gone that uh, route if it weren't for Sandy Hall. Sandy, please stand up. <laughs> Before Special Olympics, I, um, I was a uh, I was a shy person. I didn't have very many friends, so um, I didn't know very many people in my community. And so after I joined the Special Olympics, I broke out of my shyness and made a lot of friends. And as an athlete ambassador, I went to um, and uh, athlete conference, athlete leadership conference up at the uh, uh, University of Washington, Seattle campus, where I met uh, some fellow athlete uh, ambassadors from all over and made a bunch of new friends and learned some new skills in, um, in speaking. And I met Dave Lennox there. And uh, and then I, and as one of my, or only speaking opportunity besides this, I, I spoke at the Tacoma Polar Bear Plunge in 2016, and, and then uh, we actually, in Gig Harbor, are trying to get uh, input council meetings running so we can I uh, get more ideas of what our uh, of what we should do for our team in order to get new athletes because we're a small program. We um, and and so some of the uh, uh, like input uh, councils or inputs to get new athletes was have. Uh, go to resource fairs uh, for young athletes, uh, make up flyers to go around to the schools, um, and, and we got some, but not very many. So now we're trying to get a lot more uh, coming this upcoming year, uh, along with new coaches possibly, and more adult athlete, athletes like myself. And then we, um, are also um, trying to, um, well, like I said, we're trying to get a lot more input council meetings. And so we're going to do that by handing out flyers uh, through email. And, and so that's one of my goals is to get more 
uh, people involved with Special Olympics and input councils, and that's pretty much it. Thank you. Is Barb? Is Barb here? Yeah. Hey, Barb. So Barb is one of the coaches for uh, the BCATS. And could you tell us? Just yell it out. What does the BCAT stand for? Uh, BCATS is the Bremerton Kids Up Athletic Teams, and we take in a lot of kids up county and all the way up to Kingston, all the way down to course. And now we have over 400 athletes now, and we're very closely with Gary Simpson from the ACSO to make our program run. And it's just an awesome opportunity. Beautiful. Thank you very much. Uh, representing the B, uh, Bcats here today, we should have Robert Poole, the cameraman, Chad Nelson, Mel Major, Michelle, uh, and Stephanie Vandenberg. Are everybody here? So we've got about ten minutes left, and I've got about uh, thirty years of experience to talk about. So I'm going to make this relatively quick. Why is this important to me? Uh, when I was working at the city of Kirkland uh, from 1981 till 2015, or so, 2011, we had an athlete uh, family member, Nancy Billiger. Nancy was uh, an athlete. She was a sister of one of our dispatchers and was just an integral member of our family as an agency and as a, as a person. Just spectacular. She came to all of our events. She was very inspiring. We started running the torch. And as we just heard from Dave, very inspiring history with Special Olympics. Law Enforcement Torch Run um, started off in 1981 with Richard Lemonian. I'm going to kill the lights here so you don't have to look at me. Hey. Or try to figure them out anyway. There we go. Maybe. So, Law Enforcement Torch Run started in 1981, Wichita, Kansas. Six runners. Six runners volunteered to take the torch with the athletes. They raised about five, six hundred bucks that year. Chief Lemonian was called, and the, the question was, Chief, that was really cool. What can we do to help? And uh, Richard Lemonian said, I don't know, send money. So they sent a few hundred bucks. <coughs> it went national around 1984. Uh, law enforcement folks in the room, who here has done a torch run in the past or some other Special Olympics thing? Beautiful. Thank you for your help with that. Go ahead. Today, the program has grown, as it says here, into the most important grassroots fundraising on the planet. In 2000, I was uh, a member of the uh, international team for the World's Fair in Germany, Hanover, Germany. They came to me because they wanted to have a torch run. The German government had never done one before. The police, I thought it would be a good idea. They asked me because they knew that I had done it before. We sat in a room and we talked about what it meant, what it was, what it could, uh, how it could help their organization and their athletes. And as my peers with the German police said, we haven't had a very good history with our folks with intellectual disabilities, if you think back a few decades. That's not the conversation today. They took it on. We ran eight and a half miles, the furthest I've ever run in my life. I'll never do it again. God bless you if you're a runner. I'm not. But we raised awareness and we raised a few bucks. The following year, the European uh, director from Austria saw my t-shirt that said uh, Expo and Law Enforcement Torch Run Deutschland. And he actually got into an argument with me because they had never done one. He didn't know what had happened. Last uh, January, Mary Doe, I want to introduce Mary Doe. Stand up, Mary. <laughs> Mary is our law enforcement uh, liaison for Special Olympics and uh, vice president of philanthropy, I believe, is the title this week. Anyway, so um, when, when Mary and I went to the King County Chiefs meeting, and it's great to see so many cops here. When we went to the King County Chiefs meeting in January, I sat on the sideline, I've known these guys for my, uh, my entire career, and I listened to the conversation where they complained bitterly about how we can't get good public awareness, we can't raise awareness, people aren't listening to us, 
and a very uh, smart, very experienced police chief started talking about how we need to do better marketing. We need to find opportunities where we can get out in front of the public. And I'm sitting off to the side having my eighth cup of coffee that morning. I've only had three today, so you know what that looks like. And I'm trying to tell them, here's an opportunity. Here is all you need to do. Show up at this event. I'll get you in front of a camera. Show up at an event. We'll get you in front of a radio microphone. We will get your picture today, if you're interested, with athletes. Put it on your social media. This is how we raise awareness. This is how we raise public trust. This is how we have outreach with our communities. I know this because I've done it. I've seen it be successful. In 2015, over $50 million. 2016, $54 million. 97,000 cops in 40 countries. In Washington State alone, over half a million dollars. It should be more. It can be more. Every dime that we raise goes to the athletes. We are the largest contributor to Special Olympics Washington that there is. I'm on the board of directors for the state now. I go to these meetings. I listen to uh, Boeing brag about writing a check for 20 grand. I listen to Krusty's, the company, brag about dropping 10 grand. I'm not trying to smack anybody around here. Uh, but then I, I stand up and I say, oh yeah, and law enforcement last year, half a million. <laughs> when Boeing or Costco or one of these companies <coughs> drops a check for half a million dollars, then I'll be impressed. These are companies that have billions. I'm looking at this sea of cops here, and every one of them, every one of you is thinking, shut up so I can go back to work. <coughs> but at the same time, I know in your hearts that you are community <coughs> folks. Every one of you told an oral board at some time that you wanted to help people. And I see a few, a few laughs in the room. That's what we tell our oral boards when we get there. My question as a police chief, when somebody says, I want to help people, it's tell me what you've done to demonstrate that. Here's that opportunity. <coughs> Go ahead, Mary. So we're putting uh, out, starting Monday, starting today for Mason County, the Game On campaign. We're going to run it for, you okay, boss? Oh, yeah. Okay, we're going to run it for six weeks. This is an opportunity for you to do a Game On challenge, uh, and we will uh, give you some information on that here in just a little bit. Rick, would you throw me that ball? Looks just oh, like this. Him. Rex Caldwell, wow. CJTC, challenging this room, the officers in this room, to raise money for Special Olympics. Because Special Olympians are in your communities. They need your finding to make their programs better. That's my challenge to you. Game on. No. And that's what our little uh, video is going to look like here in just a moment. What it is and why we're doing it. 17,000 athletes in Washington State. Folks, there are 180,000 residents and citizens of Washington State with intellectual disabilities. We're reaching about 10% of them. With law enforcement help, we can make that better. You look at the athletes that are in the room here. When, I, when I'm at the academy and I'm teaching baby cops how to do this job that I did for so long, and for the officers in the room, you'll appreciate this. The most violent, the most confrontational challenge some of our 21-year-old cops have ever faced is a text message in all capital letters. <laughs> you think about the, the challenges, the adversity that these athletes have overcome, and it is absolutely uh, inspiring. So, is this the video? I'm going to show you this quick video. Um, I apologize for one of the actors. Every kid deserves to be an all-star. That's the reason why people like myself and law enforcement across this great state of Washington are out raising money for Special Olympics. Please join us in making a difference. Game on. Hi, Rex Caldwell, Law Enforcement Torch Run Director for Special Olympics Washington State. Here with a challenge for agencies around Washington. 2017, 2017 dollars for Special Olympics athletes in your area. Game on! Hi, I'm Kirby Winfield. My daughter Kate is a Special Olympics young athlete and I serve on the board of Special Olympics Washington. And I want to thank all you awesome men and women of law enforcement in Washington for taking the 2017 Special Olympics Law Enforcement Torch Run Challenge. Game on. Game on. Game on. 
Game on. I'm Commander Rick Bowen at the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission. I support Special Olympics because children are where it's at. Game on. I'm Sue Rar, Director of the Washington State Criminal Justice Training Commission. I support Special Olympics because it's the right thing to do. Game on. Police Academy supports Special Olympics, Law Enforcement, Court Run. Game, Game on. on. <laughs> Good job. And folks, it is that easy. Uh, I shot a lot of those videos on my iPhone. I found a guy who's a videographer who can put them together. We can put them on. I'm getting ready to dance here. <laughs> yeah, it just got frightening. Um, and you can put them on your social media very, very easily. There are 260 agencies. You'll find some paperwork on your table, as I joked earlier. Um, it's my intent today to hand out as much paperwork as possible to kind of reignite the lumber industry out here on the peninsula. Um, but we have about 260 agencies in Washington State, and every one of them raised $2,017 in 2017. That would be roughly another half a million dollars. If you were already participating like Kitsap is, and you raised an additional 2017, that would get us there. These are the things that are, uh, it benefits. Expand the athlete base. USA Games are coming to Washington State next year. The USA Games are enormous. You can tell the athletes are excited about that because there's gonna be 3,500 competitors in Washington State at the uh, Federal Way uh, uh, Aquatic Center, uh, Kenmore Bowling, UW uh, Campus, and a lot of new sports coming. There's an informational sheet on your table about 2017 for 2017. There's also a little pamphlet here if you need more to take back to your agency to distribute. There's a big pile of them up here. I'm going to let Casey talk about his letter, and then there's some additional information there for you. What I'd like to do is we're going to start a little game on kickoff here. Here are the rules, though. This ball is flat because the little rubber thingy that holds the air in fell out. When we did this last week, somebody threw it too hard, it hit the table and knocked something over. So, if you choose to throw it to somebody, here are the rules. Make eye contact. Make sure they know it's coming. And then you do this. Game on, I'm challenging Casey. Uh-oh. Casey Salisbury, Mason County Sheriff's Office, game on. James Bird, Grace Harbor County Sheriff's Office, game on. Dave Thompson, DOC. Come on. Oh. Oh. <laughs> make eye contact and make sure they know it's coming. <laughs> Bob Rivers, Mason Fire District 4. Game on. Tim McCurn, Center Bridge Fire. Game on. Oh. 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 Be ready. Good shot. Uh oh. <laughs> Sandy Hall. Uh, Peninsula Area Director and Gig Harbor um, Coach. Game on. Eye contact. There you go. <laughs> oh, <I'm>, uh, <laughs> wow. I understand. Game on. Devin Judy, Mason County Commissioner. Game Thank on. Thank you, Commissioner. <laughs> Commissioner, you ready? Yeah. Hey. So. <laughs> Gary Edwards, Thurston County Commissioner. I used to be the sheriff, and I'm standing in today for John Snaza. He asked me to do this. So. Game on for the sheriff's office. What? There you go. I contact. <laughs> yes. I'm Jim Middleton, Grace Harbor Special Olympics Director. Game on. John Lester, citizen of Mason County, <laughs> proud to support both law enforcement and special Olympics. Game on. Almost. Ross Pepper, retired sheriff of Mason County. Game on. Game on. Jeffrey Woodward, Thurston County Prosecutor's Office, game on. Dennis Douglas, Soldano, Alaska, retired, construction worker, game on. Steve Buzzard, Judge, game on. 
take control. Game on. Matt Goldson, Mason County Sheriff's Office. Game on. Okay. <laughs> Ryan, introduce yourself and then hang on to that thing. Okay. Ryan Sperling, Mason County Sheriff's Office. Game on. Thank you, everybody. There because I've seen Ryan working out and that thing's going to come rocketing at you like a dodgeball. <laughs> Plus it looks pretty flat from here. Hey, so folks, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to finally shut up and sit down, but I want to tell you that uh, if you want to start with fundraising, all you have to do is reach into your pocket. There are t-shirts in the back. The lieutenant back there has got a table. $20. $20 for the Washington LETR 2617 shirt. Big smiles, look at this. I'll even hold it like I'm wearing it. Over in the back, on the left side, you can buy these. Now, Lieutenant Travis Adams, would you raise your hand, please? Shirts are on the table. On the back, the circle of honor. The circle of honor are those agencies who have raised sufficient funds to get their name on the shirt. I am looking forward to seeing Kitsap County a couple of steps higher. I want to see Mason County on here, Thurston County, and all of the agencies represented here. I see some uh, police chief is here as well. So with that, I'm going to pass this back over to Casey and let him close us out. Hey, thank you very much. Chief Kevin Hansen, would you please stand up? Folks, this is, um, uh, well, almost, I was gonna say our newest chief, I swore another new chief yesterday. Chief Kevin Hansen, Lewis County, came up to take over the chief of our jail. I've always wanted to do this, and I wanna credit Chief Kevin Hansen for getting this going for Mason County. He said, Kevin, I've always wanted this. He stood up the state meeting and said, Mason County's in, we're going. Uh, please, a round of applause for Kevin here. <laughs> also, this morning. Sure. 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 Go ahead, Kevin. Uh oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. <laughs> uh -oh. Our office staff will be wearing our shirts in the office. <laughs> Guys on the road, you can't wear it over your uniform, but <laughs> you know, Kevin Hansen. Um, over the years, I. I I always say I had the best bosses ever, Gary. And he um, he's never introduced me to anybody that has ever done me wrong. It's always been great. And he let me know today that representing the uh, prosecuting attorney's office of Thurston County in place of John Toonheim today, who you know, a great prosecutor, um, and maybe more important than being a deputy prosecutor, uh, uh, Colonel Jeff Lippert. Colonel Lippert, would you please, where are you at? Thank you so much for coming. I didn't bring my little pass me around bear today. I think I forgot that with other stuff in the car. But I have my little fundraising bear that'll go around. But if you want to make any other donation, um, Travis Adams is all hands out there for taking anything that we can. It will all go to our Special Olympians um, and recognizing that, our t-shirts. And I'd like to have um, a great friend of mine and a great representative of so many things in the state of Washington. Rex, if you'd come back up, please. Wait, I'll get my glasses. <laughs> So I'd like to get, uh, Cammie, could you come back up? Dave and Mary, could you come up, please? I'll need somebody with a camera. That. You don't know that. Good. You want to grab the camera? I know, I know you've got a good camera here. Okay. Go. Come on over. Yeah, you got it. Uh -oh. um, on behalf of the Mason County Sheriff's Office, and I would tell you that on behalf of all the law enforcement agencies and fire agencies, emergency service personnel in Mason County, I want to thank all of you for coming down and supporting our athletes. And although they're, you can tell them they're gold, they're not gold. <laughs> uh, we'll just tell them that. Might get some free out of it. Uh, I want to give each one of you a coin for coming down today, representing um, the, the communities here and all over the state of Washington on behalf of all the law enforcement agencies. In, in Mason County, so thank you so much. And as well as Thurston and the other counties that are here today, so thank you so much for that. So I'll hand these out to each. And we'll do a picture, because this is a, this is a photo shot here. <laughs> a round of applause.
did y'all get really good pictures? All right. and, and make sure you show the Bratware uh, logo here because they're helping sponsor our shirts this year. <laughs> that's, for, that's for Rick. Thank you. Yes. One, one quick thing. If you can't donate money right now, but you're interested in donating your time for this event, please come back over the table and say, hey, I, I can I can give time. We got a lot of logistics that have to get done for the torch run. So if you're interested in volunteering in some capacity, just come back, give us your name and a contact number, and, and our committee will be getting a hold of you to help out. So I just want to make sure. Jim is kind of our uh, under Sheriff Barrett is kind of our logistics person to get people involved and where to place them. For our help so we balance that out so you can talk to under sheriff barrett about that um at the conclusion today one of the reasons i asked uh, so many of you to be uniformed today uh, all, all uniformed folks if you would please join us afterwards we want to do uh, a whole bunch of photographs uh, with our athletes and uh, with law enforcement and, and with those groups i know there's a couple fire guys in here i know uh, i got a couple fire chiefs you're absolutely welcome to join us and, and also I want to ask, and I, I keep bringing this up, but it's so important. I can't tell you how important it is, and probably you only know better than I do, that when you have a commission that supports a law enforcement agency, you're unstoppable. And I want to thank you and ask you both as commissioners uh, to join us in that today. Uh, Commissioner Shudy, you've been a tremendous supporter for us this year. And thank you. And, and obviously, Sheriff Edwards, you've been a supporter of us for a long time on both sides of it and being on the, on the commission. But if you join us today, We'd like to get some photographs to put out there. They're going to go out on our web page and be blasted all over the state. We're going to do everything we can to raise as much money as we can for our athletes. Our run, our torch run, is June 1st. And, and as, as the under sheriff said, you don't necessarily have to be a runner to be involved. But we'll take your help. But um, um, we want to get our law enforcement firefighter teams full because sometimes for every runner you have, you want a replacement because you, it gets tough sometimes. And you never know what can happen. So we want to have as many runners involved with our law enforcement agencies as we can. So please contact us. We'll be running on June 1st. Um, where's the torch at? Can we have that back at the front, please? Um, <laughs> Sheriff Simpson, if you would blast up here for a minute with us. We're going to kind of do just a ceremonial handoff to start this thing. And then at the end, just so you know, some of these have to run the same days and close in order for it to get done by the time that we uh, uh, finish the run so we can get to the state qualifiers. Um, Sheriff Simpson will be actually handing this off to me again, and it will be going to Sheriff John Snaza. So I, I kind of want to do a, a ceremonial handoff from, from the sheriff and I here, and we'll be including Sheriff John Snaza as, as he comes back out with us and we'll hand it off to the Thurston County folks. So with that, I'm going to put down the mic and do another picture with the Sheriff. He likes pictures. <laughs> there you go. There you go. Let's see. Colbert. Oh, Wayne, can you catch this? Okay. We're going we're gonna to do this a couple of times. I'm going to count one, two, three. Then I'm going to throw it in. You guys yell, game on. Got it? Got it. Okay. Ready? One, two, three. Game on! Beautiful. Game on. Game on! Okay. Not beautiful. Chief, it's coming to you. Okay. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. One, two, three. Game on! Game on! <laughs> okay. Good. A couple more? Sure, sure. Just because uh, this is entertaining? Okay. Sure. <laughs> okay. Uh, you know what? Oh, let's get the working guy who actually does this job. <laughs> One, two, three. Game on! Game on! Woo! Thank you. Game on!